Aloha, welcome to International Church. We're so glad to have you. My name's Scott. I get to be the lead pastor here. We're together, we aim to help people love God, love people, serve, and engage the world. Uh, like many of you, I watched the part of the inauguration ceremony for President Biden, Vice President Harris this week. I say some because it started at 6 a.m. And let's be real, we're only going to watch some of that. Now, the top highlight for me was definitely the, the powerfully delivered, just so well-crafted poem by Amanda Gorman. That was awesome. But my second favorite thing uh, from the inauguration was the Bernie Sanders memes. Anybody watch those? You, you come across your social media feed? Those were entertaining. Many of them were very funny. Uh, in case you missed it, what happened is the senator from Vermont showed up in a very puffy jacket and handmade mittens. Uh, very comfortable. And this was one of the memes. It said, this is Bernie's to-do list. 10.30, drop off dry cleaning. 11, Joe's thing. 2 o'clock, swing by the post office. Right? Like, Bernie Sanders showed up like, well, this is part of his day, but this ain't his whole day. He's got things going on. So it's pretty funny. Uh, and then there was Garth Brooks, who sang the uh, rendition of Amazing Grace, then started high-fiving and hugging everybody without his mask. And people were kind of awkward, not sure what to do. And while I was watching that, it actually got me thinking about Garth Brooks. Now, I know uh, he's maybe from a little bit different generation. He was big in the 80s and 90s. Some of us were, you know, born in the 80s and 90s. And I started to think about, can I name any Garth Brooks songs that I know 100% are from him? I could come up with two. And maybe that you know, shows my age and is embarrassing. But the only two I could name for certain that were his is uh, Friends in Low Places and Unanswered Prayers. That was the other one I knew. And it was Unanswered Prayers that especially caught my attention. I was thinking through what that song was about. It was released in 1990, in case you wanted to feel old today. Garth Brooks, in this song, runs into his old high school flame. And some of the lyrics are this. She was the one I'd wanted for all times. And each night I'd spend praying that God would make her mine. And if he'd only grant me this wish I wished back then, I'd never ask for anything again. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember, when you're talking to the man upstairs, that just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? I know there have been many things in my life that I have prayed for, including, like this song, I would marry my high school girlfriend, and I am very thankful. God said no to that prayer, to that request. I married a different girl from high school instead. I see, kind of looking back, why the no made perfect sense. Of course, that prayer needed to be a no. We all have those kinds of things, right? You have some of those things in your life you can look back on and be thankful for the unanswered prayers. But let's also be honest, there's also a whole other category of unanswered prayers, isn't there? There's the ones that we prayed for and God said no, and we still don't understand why. It still pains us. It still grieves us, and we are not at all one bit grateful for the fact that he said no. It's easy when you can look back and see the why, but there are those other situations that have happened that we still can't see the good, right? Like, I still don't see the good in my Aunt Barb dying of cancer in her 40s in the middle of serving the Lord in full-time ministry. I still don't see the good of my cousin Jonathan while in med school dying in a car accident. I still don't see the good between what happened with, with some really good friends of mine who struggled with infertility for years and years, finally became pregnant, and we rejoiced, and they lost their son in the womb at 21 weeks. Why? Why? I mean, if we're going to talk about unanswered prayers today, which we are, let's just be honest up front. I'm not just talking about the easy ones. All right? I'm just talking about the ones where we know the no and why it was there. Let's bring up some of the other ones. Let's be honest. Let's be real and go, there's painful no's that God has given many of us over our lives that are still unexplained. So how do we handle those? How do we handle the hopes and dreams not that we dashed, but that we're dashed by God. 
or by choices that others made. That's what we're talking about today. The title of this sermon is When God Says No. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 22. If you have a Bible with you, hard copy or on your phone, an app, invite you to meet me there. Um, as is always the case, it's always good to have Scripture open to follow along with uh, what I'm saying. But throughout the Psalms, that's going to be particularly true because sometimes you need to jump around the Psalms a little bit. Now, we're in our fourth week in this series called Hopes and Dreams. Uh, for those of you who were with us, uh, you know this, but for those who weren't, let me give you a quick recap. The first couple weeks, we focused on how God is really the only one who can satisfy our deepest hopes and dreams, the ones we have for acceptance and belonging and significance and love. God is the only one that can fix that. He's the only one that can speak to those. But last week, we also said there's a whole host of other hopes and dreams we have. Things that maybe aren't quite that deep but are still really important to us. We also have hopes and dreams for marriage, for children, or for uh, careers, or for our academics. We have hopes and dreams for you know, our bodies and weight loss or health. We have hopes for businesses or ministry efforts. We have hopes for building wealth, for fun, for enjoyment, for adventure. Those are all good hopes and dreams. Where do those kinds of things come from? Well, we saw in Psalm 8, that they come from God who has placed these kinds of things in us. He created us to have hopes and dreams, to pursue those hopes and dreams with him and make his world a better place. That was always his plan. But then we run into a couple problems. At least the first one that comes to my mind is, okay, if my hopes and dreams come from God and they're ultimately good, then why does God say no to some of them? Maybe even to many of them. All right, why does he sometimes shoot down the hopes and dreams? I think that's an important question we need to consider honestly, which we'll do today. The second question I wanted to write away is, okay, well, what about those hopes and dreams that uh, I have that are probably not pleasing to God, that aren't about serving him, but they're about serving myself, they're about building my kingdom, not his? What, what about sin in me? What about sin in the world that makes pursuing hopes and dreams hard and difficult? What about those well, that's going to be the topic for next week. So if you know more about that, come on back. So we'll talk about kind of how we ruin our own hopes and dreams next week. This week is why does God sometimes ruin our hopes and dreams? So let's explore Psalm 22. It's a passage, a piece of text many of you may be familiar with. It's actually the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. So even if you just stuck in the New Testament, you would still bump into Psalm 22 pretty regularly. It's a, it's a special scripture. It's especially helpful for those who are experiencing suffering, uh, in particularly those who are experiencing suffering and feel like God's not helping, that God's doing nothing about it. Martin Luther said of it that Psalm 22 has helped me out of difficulties from which no king or ruler could have ever freed me. So my hope and prayer is this morning it would do the same for you. Now, if you've turned to Psalm 22 in your Bible, you've already seen that uh, this is a pretty long psalm, <laughs> 31 verses to be exact. The, uh, the, they break up roughly into about three chunks. It goes from verse 1 to verse 11, with 11 being a transition verse, then from 11 to 22, with 22 being a transition verse, and then 22 to the end, 31. We're going to kind of follow it in that chunk. So I'm not going to read this one all through at once. We're just going to start uh, in that order with Psalm 22, verses 1 to 11. I invite you to read along with me. It will also be up on the screen. Psalm 22, for the director of music, to the tune of the doe of the morning, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And you, our ancestors, put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. Verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. 
You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. So we know that Psalm 22 was written by King David, and that's about all we know. We don't know what was going on in his life, when this was written, what exactly prompted him to write this psalm. But clearly, the man is in pain. Clearly, he is suffering. He's calling out to God, yet God is is silent. Even more, he says God is absent. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me, so far from my cries of anguish? Have you ever felt those words? Ever spoken those words? Probably. If you've been a Christian for a length of time, you've been here. David's in pain. He wants to know why is he suffering? Why is God sitting there with his arms crossed like a cold Bernie Sanders? Doing nothing. But here's the one thing we need to understand. I don't think that David is ultimately after answers. He's not ultimately after information here. David wants action from God. He wants God to do something to fix the situation. He's not actually looking for just an answer. right? It's like when my kids say to me, hey, Dad, why can't we go to the beach today? They're not really looking for an explanation. I could give them all sorts of reasonable answers for why we can't go to the beach today. We don't have time. We have other things to do. It's too cold. The waves are too high. We're going to get there, and you're going to whine about them, and we're going to have to leave. Yet none of those explanations are going to satisfy them because they're not actually after information. They're not actually after an answer. They're wanting me to change my mind. They're wanting me to change the situation. No, Dad, take us to the beach. And I think that's how I too would feel if I were in David's shoes. That's how I have felt when I've been in David's shoes. I don't want God to just hear me. I don't want him to just answer me. I don't want him to just explain to me why this suffering is being allowed in my life. I want him to change it. I want him to act according to my hopes and dreams. I want relief. I want rescue. You see, David starts off by asking why, but that's the only time he uses that word. The rest of the time, he never asks God why again, because he's not looking for a reason. He's looking for relief, and that's what we're looking for too. We need to understand that. Often we come to God and we ask why, and we think we're looking for information, but there's no information that would probably satisfy. Right? Why is my loved one dying of cancer? I'm not looking for information. I'm looking for healing. Why is my spouse leaving me? I'm not looking for information. I'm looking for change. Why is my body failing me? Not information. We want God to change. So when we ask, God, why am I experiencing this in my life? Why is this difficult situation happening? Why is God not doing anything about it is really what we're after. Not just answers, but actions. As verse verse 11, he closes this section by saying, God, don't be far from me, for trouble is near. There's no one to help. So David starts off in verses 1 and 2. He introduces his pain. He introduces his isolation. And then suddenly it makes this weird sharp turn in verse 3. It says, yet you are still enthroned in heaven as the Holy One. You are still the one that Israel praises. He goes, you haven't left. You haven't changed. Then in the next couple verses, he uses the word trusted three times. We have trusted you. Our ancestors trusted you. You're the one we trusted. You always came through for us, God. You've always been our protector. I know exactly where you are. But where are you now in this So both of these themes of his pain and trust in God are repeated again. We read them in verses 6 through 10. Verse 6, he goes back to his pain. I'm not even a man. I'm a worm, meaning I'm so insignificant. I'm so forgotten. There's so much shame being heaped on me by people. 
I'm being insulted. I'm despised. I'm mocked. I'm insulted even for my faith. And then in verse 8, he swings back over. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. You have been my God. You see, David's holding these two conflicting thoughts and feelings in his mind and in his prayer. On the one hand, he is in pain, and he's asking God for help and for relief. But on the other hand, in this prayer, he's expressing trust and confidence in God. And God has never failed to do what was right for David. He's always been just and holy. He's always been loving and good. And so there's this tension between both of those ideas, between the emotional turmoil and his steadfast faith. There's tension between feeling abandoned, yet trusting God's deliverance. There's this tension between hoping for a yes, but hearing a no. These two ideas together. That tension that you're familiar with, you've been praying for a yes, hoping for a yes, Hearing a no and trying to trust the voice of God and what he's saying to you. Where you want this one thing so badly, but it feels like God's not in it. He's saying no. He's shutting the door on that. You know, a, a recent example of this was my family. We were hoping to go visit uh, some of our family and relatives on the mainland uh, after Christmas. My kids haven't seen some of their friends and relatives in Colorado and Nebraska about three and a half years. It's back. We had tickets. We were wanting to go, but we were watching the COVID situation. We were praying about it and wanting it so badly, wanting to go back, wanting to see them, even in the midst of travel challenges. How can we make it work? Where can we go? Where can we get shots? How can we do this and that? And tests. And finally, in the end, we had to admit that we didn't feel like God was telling us to go. We felt like he was saying, no, don't, that he wasn't in it, that God was saying no. So We canceled it. And the why questions from my children began that I could not answer. Because there's this tension. There's a tension that many of us, but we all feel between the hopes and dreams we have and the ones that God says no to. We have this tension between hoping for a yes, hearing a no, and struggling. How do we trust God in that? And so I just want to pause right here and actually offer maybe an application already at this point up front. I tend to do this later in the message, but I'll come back for a couple more applications later. I'm going to drop them as we go. The first one I I get from reading these first few verses is that even though sometimes we're hearing a no, even though God's telling us no, Scripture never discourages us from asking for a yes. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, all right, stop asking me. Stop it. In fact, there are numerous patches that we can go to where he tells you just the opposite. Keep asking. Keep asking. Keep going. Jesus says, keep being persistent in your prayers. Keep asking God. We're told in the Old Testament over and over again, bring all of our requests to God because he cares for them. Now, of course, when we ask, we need to ask according to his will and according to his plan But never are we told, hey, these dreams and these desires are off limits. Don't bring them. No, we're told to bring them all. Bring all of our hopes and dreams to God. Lay them all down. Even if it's God, please spare me from this suffering. And even if we feel like God's saying no, keep praying for a yes. You can keep praying for relief. God is not encouraging us to be masochists. That is nowhere in Scripture. If you are in pain, You have the freedom, the right, and the invitation by God Almighty to keep praying for relief, to pray for a yes. That's the first thing. When we're in times of suffering, and we're living in this tension of, I feel like you're saying no, but I really want a yes, keep praying for a yes. David does. He keeps asking. He keeps praying. Even as he suffers, he doesn't just go, well, this is suffering. I'm a fatalist. I'm just going to lay down and take it. You don't have to take suffering lying down. That's not what the scripture teaches. You can pray for deliverance. You can pray for a yes. If you're feeling like this, this hope or dream might be too hard. Maybe that God's not on board with this thing that you're really hoping for. You can still pray for that. 
pray that he would let it happen, but you have to pray with humility and you have to pray with submission to him. But you can still pray and ask for a yes, even if you heard no the first time or the second time or the hundredth time. There's nothing wrong with asking God for a yes again. And here David, though sensing God's absence, continues to ask God for a yes, continues to plead, be with me, save me, rescue me, help me, even as the suffering seems to ratchet up a bit. His descriptions are going to get a lot more intense of what he's experiencing. Please read with me in verses 11 through 22 as as David unpacks and laments his situation further. Verse 11, do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. So Bashan is a part of Israel today that's known as the Golan Heights. Uh, And because of the Israel's topography, what it means is that that area, the Golan Heights, receives a lot more rain than other parts of Israel. So the grass is a lot lusher. The animals have a lot more to feed there. So bulls that are raised and from that area are significantly larger and bigger. So that's what he's saying. He's like, these are the biggest bulls. These are lions. They're they're roaring and they're, they're trampling me. Verse 13, roaring lions, they tear their prey. They open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. In English, we would say David is falling apart. This is getting quite painful. Verse 15, my mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and they cast lots for my garments. Things are, are definitely escalating here. The pain and the suffering is increasing actually to the point of death, the description he's giving right here is is what befits a public execution. An executioner got a dead man's clothes. They would divide up the garments in ancient Near East. Verse 19, but you, Yahweh, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. Still, despite all that, David is holding out faith and confidence that God is going to help him. That he is coming quickly. That that he is going to be on his way. That he's going to help him out. You are my strength. Rescue me. Save me. Answer me. And then in verse 22, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. See, David here is continuing to ask God for a yes. And he's going to praise him publicly. But we have not actually seen God do anything yet. God has not acted. God has not intervened here. He hasn't shown up on the scene. God in this psalm so far has not responded to David's plea for rescue and for help. And yet, David says he's going to praise and worship him among the people. All right, like, take note of that. That is really important. David never gets the yes that he is praying for. Still, here, at the point of death, He is deciding to trust God's no. That is remarkable faith. I mean, that is is true trust. That's how he's, he's handling that tension, that tension between what he wants and what God wants. His tension between his hopes and dreams and God's hopes and dreams. How does he resolve the tension between what he wants and what God wants? He's going with God. He's deciding to trust. Now, how can he do that? How can you just resolve that? Okay, I want, he wants, we're going with God. How, how does one do that? 
I believe that, for one, we see him remember what God has done in the past, which is a reminder to him of the encouragements of who God is. I believe deep, deep down, David, despite his circumstances, still knows and believes that God is good, that God is just, and that God is acting justly, that he's doing the right thing, that there is a good reason for God's silence and inaction. Just because David doesn't know the reason or doesn't like the reason doesn't mean that there can't be a reason. So he's deciding to trust that God is still a God of love. That God is still worthy of praise and honor and of glory, even when he doesn't act according to our wishes. See, David knows that when God says no, his love says so. When God says no, his love says so. When God says no, when you respond with God, why? The answer is, because I love you. He knows what's best. He has a plan. He has a plan that is for our good and for the good of his kingdom. And so while, as I said, the first thing is we can keep praying for a yes, absolutely, for our hopes and dreams, we also need to trust God's no. We can pray for a yes, and we trust God's no. Because in a sense, when God says no, he's actually saying yes to something better. He's saying yes to a different set of circumstances, a different set of choices. So a no is never just a no. It's a yes to something better. Now, that's hard for us because we are very committed to our comfort. But God says, no, I'm committed to your character. I'm committed to something better than your comfort. So when God says no, it is his love that says so. When We need to just trust that that is true about him. Now sometimes, it can even be a while later, as I said, sometimes we don't find out what the reason is, but sometimes we do. Sometimes we can see how God has brought good from tragedy in our lives. One example I think of is the Powell's family. Now this is Jameson and Catherine Powell's. Now, they had been called by God to pack up their lives and their three children's because they felt they were being called to Japan as missionaries. And they were in their final training before going overseas. When on August 1st, 2016, a semi-truck ran into their van and killed all five of them instantly. Now, in one sense, I could say, well, they are definitely better off. Instantly, they are transported into the presence of Jesus, right? They are better off. But when this first happened from a, an earthly perspective, and even thinking about the kingdom on earth, you go, how, how is this for good? We just lost passionate missionaries, passionate people for Jesus and his kingdom that were willing to go and serve him and cross the culture and around the world. However, it's been amazing to see over the last four and a half years, the amount of people that have said, I will take their place. I will go to Japan. I'll go to this part of the world. Their loss has actually brought about dozens of missionaries who cite the pals as a reason for why God has used this to call them into ministry. So there's actually greater flourishing of the kingdom happening cross-culturally without them than with them. That God used this tragedy for his purposes. And what turned out to be Jameson's final newsletter that he sent out to supporters, he actually included a quote from a, a book by John Piper called A Sweet and Bitter Providence. And he, the, the quote that he included said this, life is not a straight line leading from one blessing to the next and finally to heaven. Life is a winding and troubled road, switchback after switchback. And the point of biblical stories like Joseph and Job and Esther and Ruth is to help feel in our bones, not just know in our heads, that God is for us in all these strange turns. God is not just showing up after the trouble and cleaning it up. He is plotting the course and managing the troubles with far-reaching purposes for our good and for the glory of Jesus Christ. 
it can be hard to do. But when we believe that when God says no, his love says so, then we can trust his no. Like Jameson and Catherine did. We can trust that when God says no, it's to a better yes. And even if our circumstances don't change right away, which they often don't, we can always lift our eyes to the grander horizon, to what we know to be true of the future because God has promised it and he has shown it to us. A future where there will be no more pain and suffering. When David didn't get his way, that's exactly what he seemed to do. He looked toward the future. He praised God. And then he describes this future, which we'll read here in a second, where there's no more pain. Well, was David ever vindicated? Right? Was David ever rescued? Were his enemies vanquished? We simply don't know. We don't read about any miraculous intervention. But we do know that David's eyes aren't on his situation anymore. Right? What, I've, what we've just read, that's the end of his complaining. That's the end of his pain. He's not going back to it anymore. He's putting his eyes elsewhere in the next section, and he's putting it on what God has said about the future. Even if his senses, even if his feelings are getting him low, he's trusting God. He's lifting his gaze to the horizon of time. Read with me what he writes in verses 22 to 31. He says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, who fear Yahweh, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel. He's inviting all of his fellow Israelites to join him in worshiping God. And then this is perhaps the key verse for the psalm, verse 24. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. He has listened to the cry for help. In other words, when God says no, his love says so. Verse 25, from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to Yahweh, and he rules over the nations. You see, wow, David's vision is actually getting even grander here. Right? David is now going outside of Israel. He's saying, no, I'm looking to the future when God is going to rule not just over Israel, but over the entire world, over all nations, over all kingdoms. There's going to be a time when all will turn to God, when every knee shall bow, and God's going to rule over all things. He's looking to a future that describes that. Verse 29, so far he also said the poor are going to be lifted up, and here all the rich of the earth as well are invited. They will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. See, this is a post-death experience. Verse 30, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Now, my guess is that David probably didn't know all the details of what he was describing, exactly what that's going to be and how it's going to go down. But he was confident. The Holy Spirit had shown him that one day God was going to rule over all the earth. One day all evil would be conquered. One day all suffering would end. The universe will one day be perfect. It will be renewed. It will be restored. God is going to be here. He's going to rule over all the nations. All will worship him. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will proclaim his marvelous works, for he has done it. He has done it. This is the third thing that we can learn from this psalm. Even when we are disappointed in God's nose, even when we don't understand, we can keep praying for a yes, we can keep trusting his no, and we can look to the future. 
We can look to the future that God has promised to bring about because this suffering is temporary. This suffering is temporary. It will not last forever. Even if it takes your life, it is temporary. For those who have hope in God, for those who trust in Jesus, that is actually not the end of your life. That's just the beginning of it. The eternal life that you're going to have with God, it's still ahead. He has promised to wipe away every tear from our eyes. He's promised to mend our broken hearts. He's promised to bring eternal glory from our temporary hardships. How can he do that? I don't know. But he's God. He can do anything. That is a future worth keeping your eyes on. That is a future worth remembering even when you're stuck in pain, even when you're in suffering, that this is temporary. That's especially helpful to remember when God is out of love, choosing to not act in the way you want or to give you the answer that you're looking for. It's not going to last forever. He has promised that the best is yet to come. So look to the future. For when God says no, his love says so. Now we could stop right there and we'd have a pretty good handle on this psalm. I think, on its core message of what this was talking about when David wrote it. And as an ancient Jew reading this text, we probably would be satisfied with those conclusions. But for Christians, that's not the end. We're not done actually getting to the core of this psalm yet. You see, we have the benefit of the New Testament. We have the benefit of living 3,000 years later and having more information than David did. We have the benefit of knowing Jesus. We have the benefit of seeing Christ. We know more of the story. In fact, we know the real point of this psalm. Can I tell you this mystery? There's a mystery here in Psalm 22. It's not actually about David. Psalm 22 is actually about him. Psalm 22 isn't actually about you or me or our pain either, though it certainly applies to all of those. Psalm 22 is actually about Jesus Christ. Remember when I said earlier that Psalm 22 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament? That's because every single gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when describing the culmination of Jesus' life and ministry, his crucifixion, when they are talking about the cross, they talk about Psalm 22. Every single one of them. The 18th century English preacher Charles Spurgeon said that this is beyond all others, the Psalm of the Cross. The first verse I read this morning may have sounded familiar to your ears. You may be like, oh, I thought that was somewhere else in the Bible. You may have thought of Matthew 27, when Jesus is on the cross, and we read that at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, we need to remember that the Psalms didn't originally come with numbers. Right? David didn't name his Psalm, Psalm 22 or Psalm 23. They didn't come with numbers. There were no chapter headings. There were no titles. There were no numbers. There were no verses. So how did ancient Jews find the text or reference something that they were talking about? You used the first line to refer to the whole thing. So their words for the books of the Bible, for the first five, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy— They reference those by simply using the first word. The name of each Genesis is just beginning, because in the beginning. So when Jesus is on the cross, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is quoting the first line of Psalm 22. He actually goes on to quote a couple other points as well. A lot of people think that when he's hanging there and he says, It is finished, he's referring to the final line. God has done it. So when he's quoting that first line, he's actually referring to the whole thing. I think Jesus on the cross is saying, guys, this right here, what I am doing on this cross, if you want to understand what's going on here, Psalm 22. That's about this. It's always been about this. It's always been, first and foremost, about me. It's about my death. And if you read Psalm 22 again, which I would 
beg and encourage you to do today. We won't do it for time. Read Psalm 22 again and put the psalm on the lips of Jesus. You will see a lot of things in this psalm that drop into clear focus that seem kind of weird coming from David. Right? David was never publicly tried and executed, but Jesus was. David never had his, his clothes torn from him and split up and given to an executioner's. Jesus did. David never had his hands and feet pierced. Jesus did. David's death did not lead to national and international faith and revival in God. The death of Jesus did. This whole thing is about Christ. When the, the inaction of God as his son is on the cross is the kindest, most meaningful, most important, yet most serious display of love imaginable. That's God saying no. Right? The father could have brought an end to the son's suffering. The son could have brought an end to his own suffering, calling legions of angels to just end this pain and suffering that he was experiencing on the cross. Not just physical pain and suffering, but the spiritual and emotional pain of suffering of the sins of the world being fused with him. He knew that this was the means of salvation. He knew that if he didn't die, we had to die. So he went into death so that we could be spared from eternal death. Jesus was forsaken so that you and I can be forgiven. Jesus was abandoned, so you and I never have to be. The Father did turn away from the Son so that he would never have to turn away from us. You want proof that how can suffering lead to good? Look at the cross. Jesus is the ultimate proof that suffering can lead to glory. How could it possibly be good? I mean, if you think of the cross, it's the worst moment in history. God becomes human flesh. This innocent, good, godly, divine son of man is being executed for no crime. It's the worst thing in history. And yet God flips that on its head and makes it the best thing in history. So if God's going to do his greatest work of salvation through suffering in his own life, maybe, just maybe, he can bring about great and good things in your life through suffering too. Jesus is proof that God's love sometimes requires a no. And when God says no, his love says so. I mean, nobody understood better than Jesus what he was doing. Jesus knew and understood why he had to die. Yet, do you remember what he does in the garden before he goes to the cross? He prays because, Father, if there is any way for this to pass by me, if there's any way you would let me out of this, please say yes. Yet he knew God said no. He knew the answer had to be no. So we see Jesus praying for a yes, yet trusting the Father's no. We see Jesus prayed for a yes in the midst of the no. We see him trust God's no, and we also see him look to the future. See, we see Jesus enact this Psalm 22, following the same things that David does. He prays for a yes. He trusts God's no. He looks to the future. He trusted the future. Hebrews 12, 2 says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. And Jesus didn't endure the cross because the cross was joyful. No. He endured the cross, the death, the sin, because he knew on the other side was going to be an eternity with his people. A kingdom that involved him saving you and me. Friends, we have a God who gets it. He gets it. We have a God who you can accuse of maybe not caring, of not hearing, of whatever, but you cannot accuse him justly of not understanding. He gets it. He lived it. He has tasted the human experience. In fact, he has tasted shame and abandonment and abuse and pain and suffering in ways that 
None of us probably ever will. The father and son, the, what they did for us, that's nothing short of shocking and unimaginable. He died in our place, and then after his death, he rises from the grave, and he declares the good news to his disciples. And he said that through them, he would continue to declare the good news. He preaches his gospel through his disciples around the world so that they would tell people who tell people who spread it to the ends of the earth so that we might shout with Psalm twenty-two thirty-one from the rooftops, he has done it. I know it's hard when God says no. It was hard for Jesus. I know it's hard, but God knows it far more than I do. God gets it. He experienced all of this. He tasted it in ways, as I said, that we never even could. So we have a God who gets it, a God we can trust. We can pray for a yes. We can trust God's no. And we can look to the future. Why can we do that? Because we are confident that when God says no, his love says so. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a good father you are. Even when you don't give us what we want, you always give us what we need. We're committed to our comfort, but you're committed to our character. You're committed to your kingdom. You never lose the big picture, God, even when we sometimes do. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust that truth. Trust you and your love for us. Thank you for sending your son to save us. God, not, not only is, is he the clearest example of faithful trust and submission, and, and not only is he a suffering savior on our behalf, but he's also a brother who gets it. He shows us how, Lord, how we can respond rightly to your loving nose. What a magnificent Savior he is. We love him and we pray these things in his precious name. In the name of Jesus, amen.